And we ask you to bless in the service now and give us wisdom in your scripture. Let the sweet Holy Spirit have freedom to move in this house. And then, Lord, give me unction that I might uh, bring forth your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's good to be here. Hallelujah. <laughs> Tell you the truth. An awful lot of places I know I could be. God's been good to me. He's brought me to this point in my life. He's been real good to me. And uh, I thank him for it tonight. I do. I thank the good Lord. Uh, I want you to have your Bibles. I'd like for you to turn with me tonight, if you would, to the book of Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Scripture says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and slowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Father, anoint the word now, Lord, through the speaker, through the messenger. In thy name I pray, amen. The Scripture says that God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. The, uh, in my experience, has been, and I'm not speaking for everybody, simply for myself, that my experience has been that we have far more pride in the church than we do humility. Amen. And that includes my own life and the way I should be constantly alert and watching out for uh, any and all manifestations of pride. In the Old Testament, the king of Babylon, his name was Nebuchadnezzar, he was at that time the most powerful king in the world. But God reduced him to living in the fields and eating grass like an ox or an animal for seven years. And the purpose of it was that you might learn who I am, that you are nothing and you're not on that throne by your own power, but by mine. And it took seven years, but he learned his lesson. And you often ask yourself this question, why was God concerned about the king of Babylon? But of course we understand the Lord has his reasons for things he may never reveal to us in this world, but that's okay. No question in my mind that he reduced uh, this king to that position. He exalted Daniel, made him second in the kingdom. And Daniel, of course, is mentioned in the Bible as one of the three men whose righteousness is brought before the Lord and God recognizes the righteousness of that man. And that's quite a thing. Uh, when you think about our Lord Jesus Christ, how he humbled himself, and this, of course, is, could be a lengthy thing tonight, so I'm just going to kind of touch around with it a little bit. But he humbled himself. And when he did this, uh, he was literally humiliated in the eyes of the people. The great God who created everything from everlasting to everlasting, he came into this world to die a, a, a humbling death, an accursed death on a cross. And so I want to quote some things that he said himself, and he said these in the Gospel of John. And uh, I think it's quite appropriate because the Gospel of John, if you remember chapter number 9, he said to the blind man, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe? He said, I've been speaking to you. It's, thee that, it's me that's talking to you. So there he identified himself, and this is one of many places, as the Son of God. In other words, the Gospel of John is dealing with his deity. But God has a way of approaching a thing that will make you think. And that's what we want you to do tonight. I want you to think. Uh, I love the Bible. The Bible is quite a remarkable book, folks. You read, you read a scripture through and you think you've got everything it said. Then uh, get on your knees and pray and then read through it again. And, then, and when you're done with that, pray again and read through it again. And it's amazing at how it begins to open up its secrets to the soul it wants to know. In Matthew chapter 20, he said this. But it shall not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He's laying forth the purpose. 
Now he says in Luke 22, But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that, as he that doth serve. And this is God's a way of approaching things. Now, not only is it a spiritual truth that humility is a great grace from God, but it's also a practical thing because of what humility does in your life and how it helps you to receive spiritual gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Remember, he resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. We today, we've got technology, we've got organization, we've got big buildings, we've got charisma, we've got everything. We don't need God. Amen. We don't need him, do we? Now, of course, that's sarcasm. You understand that I'm, that's not at all what I believe. But uh, this is the way a lot, of, a lot of the ministry, they approach it with that attitude. And uh, that's wrong. That's wrong. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, uh, he said, what do you have that you didn't receive of the Lord? And the truth of the matter is nothing. We don't have anything except God gave it to us. And uh, he gives according to the grace of God, and the grace of God is directly affected by your pride. You may have an intellect of, of, uh, of 160, 70, 80. You may be a brilliant individual, gifted from God. I mean, you're Mensa. No question, you're smart. But the truth of the matter is there never seems to be any real ministry work involved in your life, and you never seem to be able to bring forth any real fruit for God. And just absolutely, you know, what you're doing is trying to do it by the arm of the flesh. That's what you're doing. And this is what people look up to today. And the Bible says in the book of 1 John, that which is highly esteemed among men is the abomination to God. Yeah, he named off three things there. Oh, yeah, they're an abomination to him. And that which is highly esteemed among men is beauty, intellect, charisma, accomplishments, uh, you know, all these things. That's what men look for. And they say, my, we have a leader there. No, you don't have a leader. The Lord Jesus Christ was the greatest leader that ever walked this earth. And a humbler man never lived. He was the most humble of all who ever drew a breath of life on this earth. Now, the Bible said Moses was a meek man. Moses had a temper, but he was meek. And he was willing to die for his people. And so, in my estimation, I've always respected Moses you know, within the top five of all the people in that Bible. Moses is right up there at the top. Amen. Along with Abraham, and along with Daniel, along with some men like that. Noah. Look at Noah. But the Bible says this in John 13. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example. Okay, this is an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Now, don't you think about this for a moment. How many of those disciples were there? All 12? Sure they were. Yeah. Did not he say, uh, I've washed you, but one of you is unclean? Certainly he did. So who is that, of course? That's the one that betrayed him, Judas Iscariot. He washed his feet, knowing that he would betray him. That's humility. He had to get down on his knees to do that. He humbled himself. But notice it said that once I have been sent. Notice, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Now, don't you notice something about this? This is important. Uh, in verse number 38 of John chapter number 6, read that with me. John chapter number 6 and verse number 38. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So what does that mean, preacher? Well, you know, you've heard it preached, and it makes good preaching. It really does. The Lord Jesus says, I'll go and save them. How many has ever heard that preached? That's good preaching. But do you want to get scriptural about it? Here's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. I'm yours, Father, whatever you want me to do. He had completely yielded himself unto the Father before he ever left heaven and was incarnate in flesh. He was sent 
He was sent from heaven. So therefore the sending has to do uh, with God's purpose in sending him. But it also has to do with his attitude toward being sent. He was willing to accept whatever the Father had laid aside for him. And that, of course, uh, wound up being the cross. Uh, he said in John 5, verse 19, he said, Verily I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So how does this work? He sees the Father do them. And he says, I can do nothing of myself. Now, did not the Lord Jesus Christ say, I could call 12 legions of angels? Of course he could. He never one time gave up his deity. The Lord Jesus Christ was still the second person of the Godhead when he was here on this earth 2,000 years ago. And by his own power, he could have exercised the power of God. But he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. He had completely yielded himself as the servant of the Lord. He was serving the Father, and the Father worked His will out through His Son. Now, you know, this is not an easy thing. A lot of people have a hard time, and, and, and the truth of the matter is, when you get into the Trinity, you get into, you get into a mystical thing. You certainly do. It's not easy to explain it, but I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, because the Bible reveals the Godhead as such, and the Lord Jesus Christ said plainly, he said, I can of my own self do nothing. In plain words, he says, I will not allow myself to do anything except what I hear from the Father. So he's teaching us what a servant is and what the servanthood is important. In John chapter number uh, 5 and verse number 30, and the Bible said, and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Day after day, according to the book of Isaiah, he was taught. He learned. He started out as a child, and he learned. He learned by the power of the Holy Spirit of God teaching him day in and day out. What is that? That's the manhood of the Son of God. He divested himself of knowledge when he incarnated himself in flesh. And then he was taught by the Holy Spirit throughout his early years, his formative years. He listened to the voice of God. Now, he had, he could, only God can do that. I cannot do that. I don't have the power to just divest myself of my knowledge and, and, you know, no longer do I know it. But he did. But he did it for a specific reason. And that is that he would start with square one. That he would start just like you start. Like all of us start. When we came into this world, we didn't know anything. We learned. We learned. And if you come into the right tutelage, you're blessed because you can learn, you can learn what you should learn and the way you should learn it. But that's not always the case because the problem with the culture in America today is you see what's happening with children. They're being brainwashed. You do not have an education unless you are able to think analytically. If you cannot take that mind and do your own research with it and come to a logical conclusion, research, you don't have an education. You got a head full of facts that you were that were put into you when you went to a college somewhere, but you have not educated, and that's sad to say. But uh, I remember one of the professors I had when I a little bit of time I spent in school. He said this. He said the greatest education you'll ever get is your ability to find stuff, to know where it is. And I'll tell you right now, that was a great lesson. In other words to know which books to go to, to know, to know how to research, to know how to run it down. And that's a great lesson. And if, you know, if I've spent my whole lifetime studying and I still study, I read and I intend to. And hopefully if I do that, uh, what little I've got left up here will stay with me till God gets ready to leave me out of this world. <laughs> because I hate to get to the place to where I couldn't think. That would be bad, that would be horrible. So the Lord said plainly, 
I didn't come to seek my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He said in John 5, 41, I receive not honor from men. So I don't care what you think about me. I'm not, I'm not here to please you. I'm not here to make you, to make you, to make you uh, think that I'm anything other than what I am. Here, in other words, here's what he says. He says, you accept me for who I am. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Some of Moses, some of Elijah, some of Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? At Caesarea Philippi. And Peter, as always, impetuous, speaking forth spontaneously from what's in his soul, says, Thou art the Christ, Mashiach, the Son of the living God, deity, the Son of God. Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. In other words, Simon, son of Jonah. That's what bar means. Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, there's a knowledge that can come down that is greater than anything you'll ever get from this earth. It's greater. It's the knowledge that God gives you from above. There's no question in my mind. I am absolutely firmly, if, my, if I draw my last breath in this house tonight, there is no doubt, there is no question whatsoever. The Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Amen. Amen. Manifest in the flesh. Yes, sir. Where'd I get that from? I got it from God. That's where I got it from. You listen to people, they'll tell you everything under the sun. Huh, who's Jesus? Well, he's this, he's that, he's this, he's that. Well, I'll tell you what I know him to be. And no question, I also know him to be this. I know him, he's the Savior. How do you know that? He saved me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so what I'm trying to do is lay a foundation for you tonight. In John chapter number 7, verse 28. Now, I want you to look at this. I'd like for you to read it. This is important because this helps lay the foundation of the attitude that Christ had and what he had given up by coming into this world and how he became the servant of the Lord. And look at it now. John chapter 7, verse 28. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. Now look at this. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Now look at the wording carefully. What's he say? Neither came I of myself. Did you see that? In other words, he said, I didn't just stand one day and decided I'm going to go down and be the Savior. No, no, no. He stood before the Father, completely open, completely dependent. He had already given himself to the Father to do the Father's will. And the Father said, Son, you go. And he came by the will of the Father. He said, the hour is coming when the Lord Jesus is going to come back. And he said, the Son of God doesn't even know when that day is going to be. How many of you ever heard that? Well, that's the Bible. It's the truth. Why? Because the Father holds it in his hands. Why wouldn't Christ know? He could know. Certainly he could. But even at that, he leaves it to the hand of the Father to make that decision as to when he comes back. Now, if I was a Jesus only... I'd have a hard time with some of these scriptures that I've been giving you tonight. They deny the Trinity. They deny the Trinity. And you've got to be awful careful with some of this stuff. I'm not going to come along and, and say any more that, that, that's, that's necessary to say. But I'm going to tell you this. The Lord Jesus Christ is not the Father. He's the Son. And He's not the Holy Spirit. He's the Son. And yet the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all make up one God. Just one, not three. Just one God. But each one of them have their own specific identity. And working together in unison, they make up what we call the Godhead tonight. So the Lord Jesus Christ said, I did not come of myself. Isn't that something? Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Meditate on that. <laughs> what do you think about that? See? Take it home. Meditate on it. Think about it. Ask God to give you light on it. This is how you study the Bible. You can get 55 commentaries, a thousand. Go ahead and read everything anybody, everybody's got to say. Here's what you'll find. You'll find your commentaries will be in this camp, this camp, this camp, this camp. And you can all, you can tell, you, you don't have to read much if you've read at all. Well, I know where he's coming from. 
I know where he's coming from. I know what he's going to say next. I know where he's coming from, okay? And that's fine. They have their opinion. That's good. But the thing about it is, what do you believe? Ask God to teach you and show you and give you light. This is what's important about the Word of God. Now, he says this in John chapter number 14, verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Here we go now. Here we get into the mystery of the Godhead. Believe thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Now, how in the world could he do that? He's standing here, and God the Father's up there. <clears throat> there is no explanation or definition of a spirit being. It just declares him to be that. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In plain words, a spirit can be standing here and standing in heaven too at the same time. Unencumbered by time, space, or any of that. We do not know the limitations of a spirit because we don't know the essence of a spirit. And God's a spirit. And so here's what he said. He said, believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Of course he is. It's what's called the reciprocal indwelling of Christ. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Here again, he says, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Huh. The Father is dwelling in his Son and does the works. Yet he uses the hand of the Son to do the work. But the hand of the Son does the work by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. See? Yes, sir. In Genesis chapter number 1. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There was darkness. The Spirit of God said, let there be light. And there was. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit never works alone. He's part of the Godhead. Nor does Christ ever work alone. He's part of the Godhead. So this is <coughs> what it's trying to say to us. I think it's quite a revealing thing. Because he's saying, I'm in this world I came to this world because I'm a member of the Godhead and I had yielded over to the Father to be the one who does, does the sending, the anointing, imbument with power and direction and whatever I hear him say, that's what I do and I listen for his voice and it doesn't matter to me what you say, what I hear from the Father is what I do. And that was his life. His life was an absolute servant, completely yielded to the power of Almighty God and to his, and to his, uh, to his, his, his deity, sovereignty. And so therefore the Bible says, God did not give the Spirit by measure unto Christ, but he did me. And I guarantee it tonight, by what little Holy Ghost I've got, I can rejoice in it because I give him a hard time. <laughs> How about you? Anybody else around like that? Anybody else grieves the Holy Ghost or quenches the Holy Spirit? Well, I sure you do. I've done my part, but I've also felt, found the power of the, felt the power of the Holy Ghost move up and down my soul. Oh, yeah. And I mean, it's, a, it's, like, it's like Peter, James, and John. Lord, it's good that we're up here on top of this mountain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, let's build three tabernacles. Oh, boy. I'm sure they enjoyed the top of that mountain. But there's also a cross that lies beyond. So... Yes, thank God for that. All right, now I'm going to read one more to you, and then I'm going to read something that uh, uh, one of the old divines has, uh, ha that has gone on before us. I have loved and greatly appreciate him. The minute I mention his name, most of you will know who I'm talking about. But in John chapter 14, verse 24, it says this, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. So therefore, you don't keep his sayings simply out of obedience. Obedience is a good thing to have. But your greatest motive in serving God and serving Christ is love Him. And when you love Him, you're doing something to Him that an angel can't do. You remember what I said? Now, it's possible, I suppose, that an angel can love, but the Bible nowhere says they can, but you can. And when God looks at your soul and measures your stature, don't you think 
Don't you think that he can read your title clear from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet? And he can watch the motivation as it begins to mature in your heart, as you begin to grow in the Lord, until you get to that point to where it's not a matter of right and wrong, it's a matter that I love him. <laughs> and that's how I'm going to live. That's right. And I'm going to live to please him. Not because it's right and wrong, because I love him. See, that's a, that's a greater motive. That's your love for the Father and for the Son. So he says here, He that loveth me not keepeth not my commandments or my sayings, which is true. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Now, don't you notice how the word is used here? Word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Logos. Now, here's what this means. And the word, he's speaking in a collective sense. He's not saying that I have specifically said this or that, even though he specifically says this or that. But what he's saying is, I have given you the word of God. See, I have spoken from God. God has spoken forth from me. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So here we have one, was he humble? Of course he was. He was humble. No more humbler man ever walked on this earth than our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you listen to this. And uh, I'll give you his name right here in a moment. These words open to us the deepest roots of Christ's life and work. They tell us how it was that the Almighty God was able to work his mighty redemption through him. They show what Christ counted the state of heart which became him as the son of the father. They teach us what the essential nature and life is of that redemption which Christ accomplished and now communicates. It is this. He was nothing that God might be all. He resigned himself with his will and his powers entirely for the father to work in him. Of his own power, his own will, his own glory of his whole mission, with all his works and his teaching, of all this he said, it is not I, I am nothing, man. I have given myself to the Father to work, I am nothing, the Father is all. Amen. Now we'll read Philippians in a moment, and you'll see what the Apostle Paul said about that. But listen to this. His humility was simply the surrender of himself to God. To allow him to do in him what he pleased, whatever men around him might say of him or do to him. He teaches us where true humility takes its rise and finds its strength in the knowledge that it is God who worketh all in all, that our place is to yield him in perfect resignation and dependence, in full consent to be and to do nothing of ourselves. The root of all virtue and grace, of all faith and acceptable worship, is that we know that we have nothing but what we receive and bow in deepest humility to wait upon God for it. Andrew Murray. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Anything you can get a hold of that Andrew Murray wrote, well, you've got some good stuff. He's... He's, he's a lot, some call him the, the apostle of, uh, of a consecration and dedication and, and communion with God, Andrew Murray. He spoke on a level and had an insight. He could look into things, and as I just read to you, lay it out for you to understand what he's saying. Andrew Murray. Now, we're talking about men that live in the 1800s. If you want to get, uh, I'm not dispelling all the uh, contemporary stuff, but if you want to get good stuff, you go to the 1700s, and you go to the 1800s, and you go to the early 1900s. You get the old stuff. Well, that's old, preacher. That's, that's the best. <laughs> that's the good stuff. Get the old stuff and start reading it. Isaiah 65 verse 5 says this. Which say, stand by thyself. Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. I've had a little dose of that every once in a while, haven't you? You see some poor old soul wallowing around in their sin, and you, th and you say, oh, thank God I'm not there. Well, that, that'd be good if that's all it was to it, but a lot of times it goes deeper than that. You begin to compare yourself with that individual. And there's the problem. 
comparing themselves with themselves. They are not wise. 1 Timothy 1.15, a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. You all know who said that. And he meant every word of it. And this is the final text I'll read for you tonight. And this is such a blessed text because it covers everything I told you about. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, <laughs> that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. Through that humiliation, through that total surrender and dedication to God in Philippians 2, the Lord Jesus Christ stripped Satan of every power he had and made a show of him openly and by his resurrection from the dead sealed Satan's doom. And yet Satan is a liar and a deceiver that walks about seeking whom he may devour. If you're a real Bible believer in here tonight, you're really born again. You really know the Lord Jesus Christ. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your mortal bodies. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. For whatever the context might be, God can do above and beyond all that you ask or think. We need to work together as brothers and sisters. We need to support each other. We need to pray for each other. The last thing I said Sunday was pray about the service Wednesday night. And I've been praying about our service tonight. I've talked to God time and time and time again about Temple Baptist Church, about the ministry of this church. If you have the erroneous idea that you're going to find yourself a spiritual church somewhere where you can do something for God, you are as deluded as you could possibly be, and I'm going to be as nice as I can by saying that. Everywhere you go on this earth, everybody you see is a sinner. But the difference is some learn what that is, and they've learned the secret from God that if they'll confess it, they can walk in fellowship with the Lord and have fellowship one with another, and they can get something done for God. And that's what we do. That's what I try to do. That's a leader as, as, as the, you know, the under shepherd, the bishop of the flock. That's my responsibility tonight is to teach us and starts with me. Spoke to a man one time. He said, oh, we all have a little problem with pride. It's not a little problem. It's a big problem. It's not a little problem. It's a big one. And it includes me. I preached about Diotrephes. You remember him? Over there in 3 John. Do you know who he was prating against? Do you know who this man was talk speaking against? He was speaking against the Apostle John. <laughs> you talk about arrogance. And yet, I got to looking at myself and thinking, well, you know, I got some, had some diatrophies in here. You got some diatrophies in you too. I hate to scare you like that, but we all have a certain amount of that, and we need, by the grace of God, to put it to death. Amen. Amen. Put it to death. What are we without Him? The Apostle Paul says. We who are nothing. <laughs> and so, you know, that flies in the face of self-exaltation and self-love. Father, bless your word. Thank you for these dear folk tonight who were gracious enough to sit and listen to what I had to say. And Father, I pray that we'd apply these truths to ourselves, every one of us, every last one of us. And the ones who are watching by the internet, watching it live streamed or watch it later at archived. 
Our Father, use, your, use it, Lord, for the glory of God, to teach us, a, teach us basic building blocks of how we grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. We have to understand these things and confront them and deal with them. And therein we get the victory. We get the victory once we understand our enemy. Once we know who we're fighting against, then we, get to, we, we can get the victory. We ask it in Jesus' name. And I want anybody bow, to raise your head up. Just keep your head bowed. And I just want to pray for you tonight. And there may be somebody in here that would say, Preacher Lawson, don't you pray for me now. I know you confess that you have some diatrophies in you, and I do. Uh, well, I do too, preacher, and I want you to pray for me because I've got a he's in me too. God bless you. God bless you. Got hands up everywhere tonight. Good. That's a good thing, see. That's an honest, that's an honest assessment of who you are and what's happening in your spiritual life. God bless you back there. God bless you. God bless you. That doesn't condemn you or God bless you back there, brother. That doesn't, doesn't condemn you and make you some kind of a sorry low-down dog. What it does, it gives you spiritual discernment. And that's what discernment is about. Try the spirits. And we all have to deal with him. God bless you back there. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every soul that raised their hand. Lord, give them victory tonight. Maybe, Heavenly Father, the foundation that was laid tonight might be, might be used to speak forth, step forth, to move forward toward you and to learn the things that the Spirit of God alone can teach us. We ask it in Jesus' name now and for his blessed righteous name's sake. Amen. Amen.